Welcome to week 7's lectures on A Christmas Carol. In today's lecture, I'm going to discuss the Gothic city and how the city, which is being fueled by the Industrial Revolution uh, in Great Britain, is turning into uh, the city of spectres. A Christmas Carol opens with Ebenezer Scrooge in his chilly counting house on Christmas Eve outside London. Uh, the Great Wen is shrouded in filthy brown fog. It is the hungry 40s. The 1840s saw huge distress among the working classes and mass starvation in Ireland. Chartism, a working class reformist movement, raised the fearful possibility of revolution. It was a nervous time. The details in this set of criticism establishes the context for Dickens' A Christmas Carol, which was published in 1843. This novella captures the tone of the hungry 40s in Great Britain. Scrooge, who is comparatively comfortable than the rest of his brethren uh, in London, is still not willing to spend on coal. Therefore, his counting house is chilly. The entire London, the London outside his county ho counting house, is shrouded. The word shroud is very interesting in the Gothic context. Uh, there is the suggestion of the funeral uh, embedded in the word uh, shrouded. Entire London is covered in this filthy, dirty, brown, bleak fog, which is preventing visibility. The there were uh, starvation deaths in Ireland at that time and the working classes in Great Britain were anxious and in distress. They were not comfortable. The reformist movement, movements were ongoing. Um, one such uh, was the Chartist movement. And the Chartist movement is suggestive of the possibility of um, a revolution in Great Britain. Um, something in the uh, fashion of uh, the French Revolution was expected in Great Britain, but um, it didn't happen anyway. Nevertheless, it was a nervous time. Uh, the hungry 40s, the 1840s, was a nervous time in Great Britain. And uh, Scrooge is used as a symbol to resolve some of the problems in um, society. The solution for providing comfort, economic comfort, is invested on the soldiers, uh, on the shoulders of um, the individual, and that individual is Edna Scrooge in Dickens' A Christmas Carol. So the act of charity was invested with a lot of faith in this particular novella. Opposite Scrooge's door, a dying woman is sitting in the gutter, ghosts of rich businessmen dancing around her. It is they who have brought her to the sad pass. It's an interesting image uh, that begins um, the novella. Outside of the counting house of Edna Scrooge, there is a poor woman sitting um, outside and uh, Around her, there are ghosts of rich businessmen who have brought her to this kind of situation where she is homeless and penniless. What is implied is this. If the businessman had been charitable, this woman would not be outside in the cold uh, during winter and at and, and the time of Christmas. Immediately, the point that I was uh, um, just mentioning comes to mind again. The idea that charity can do a lot of good to um, the poor people in society is uh, suggested uh, time and again in this um, novella. And you can once again see the gothic overtones of this novella with the ghosts of businessmen you know, prancing about, dancing around uh, this poor woman. At the end of his 12-hour day, Scrooge dismisses his clerk, Bob Cratchit, 
uh, Cratchit, his name evokes a scratching pen, is a scrivener. Before typewriters and photocopying machines, the necessary copying of business and legal documents was done longhand. Crutchet has one day's holiday a year and earns 15 shillings, 75 uh, pence per six-day week, half a crown a day. On it, he supports a large, happy, but chronically hard-up family. The family's favorite is Tiny Tim, a little crippled boy. The details here um, establishes the details establish the fact that uh, Edmund Scrooge uh, had been paying starvation wages to his clerk, and the name of the clerk is interesting because it symbolically indicates the kind of work that he uh, does. He is crutching on a piece of paper with a pen. Um, in other words, he is copying uh, information before. Um, typewriters and photocopiers uh, came into this world. Uh, so that's his uh, job. And Pratchett is chronically hard up. He is perpetually uh, penniless. He is perpetually hard up uh, in the sense that there's not sufficient money to run the family comfortably. And therefore, the family is um, in difficult circumstances. The family's favorite uh, is Tiny Tim, the crippled boy, and despite the financial distress of the family, uh, the members are uh, quite uh, at peace with themselves. The first stirrings of the tale can be found in a visit Dickens made to Magister a month before he began writing. One of the great artists of his time only fragments of his eloquence, alas, survive. He spoke at the city's uh, Athenaeum on 5th October. It was a memorable evening for those present and those who read accounts of the speech in the next day's papers. Dickens gave a lecture in Manchester the month before he started writing uh, A Christmas uh, Carol. He was a great orator. He had eloquent uh, speaking skills. Um, much of it doesn't survive, his speeches don't survive uh, intact, but there are only uh, fragments here and there. But those who uh, watched his, listened to his speech on that day, uh, were uh, much impressed by the nature of truth and the rhetoric with which he used to uh, communicate the truth to the audience. And Manchester is an industrial town. As Dickens' biographer Michael Slater describes, Dickens dwelt on the terrible sights he had been he had seen among the juvenile population in London's jails and doss houses and stressed the desperate need for educating the poor. This occasion seems to have put into his mind the idea for a Christmas tale which should help to open the hearts of the prosperous and powerful towards the poor and powerless, but which should also bring centrally into play the theme of memory that, as we have seen, was always so strongly associated with Christmas for him. In that speech, uh, Dickens records the need to educate the poor, the needy, and he also um, states that the prosperous, the rich, the wealthy have to open up their hearts towards those who are in need in society. Further, um, the idea of memory uh, is important um, to Dickens. The idea of memory does play quite a, uh, a bit of a role in much of his um, uh, fiction and uh, as always, Christmas is also associated with uh, remembering, remembering one's friends and family and the society. Um, therefore, this idea of memory is also used uh, very, very significantly in this Christmas tale because uh, Dickens uh, makes Scrooge remember in a very, very potent manner about his past and how that past transforms his present. Dickens was much affected by the kind of life that the poor children lived in, had in London's jails. And the word uh, DOS houses referred to lodging houses where the uh, very poor uh, stayed with very basic amenities. 
Manchester, the workshop of the world, was famous not merely for its industry, but the utilitarian philosophy that drew it. It may not be clear what Scrooge's line of business is, but his beliefs before his change of heart are crystal clear. Pure Manchester. Are there no workhouses, he asks. When the two gentlemen ask for a charitable donation, um, this is his rhetoric, are there no uh, workhouses? If the poor die, like the poor woman outside his house, it will, he says, solve the surplus population problem. Concern over overpopulation had been stimulated by the stern philosophy of Thomas Robert Malthus, who foresaw, who foresaw catastrophe for England if its masses were not checked by famine, war, or disease. The two things, one, industrial revolution was fueling poverty. It was um, drastically affecting the fabric of society. Rural population were affected by uh, the rapid pace of industrialization. Second, there was uh, the issue of surplus population, especially the poor, which is represented by um, not just uh, Bob Cratchit and his family, but also that woman who was outside of the counting house, homeless and penniless. So um, there was this uh, philosophy of Robert Malthus who believed that the overpopulation would become catastrophic unless it was checked, unless the population was reduced by famine, war or disease, which would wipe out uh, this kind of population. So John Sutherland very, very powerfully uh, in this uh, set of criticism lays bare some of the uh, trajectories running through uh, London and which was uh, refracted through the work of uh, Charles Dickens in A uh, Christmas Carol. Edmund Scrooge represents the hard uh, philosophy, the uh, hard-heartedness of the industrial uh, philosophy, uh, the hard, uh, flinty nature of industrialism. And therefore, uh, some of his questions, um, such as the one, are there no workhouses to take care of the poor, um, make sense within that uh, framework, workhouses were set up in order to look after the poor, but they were not doing their work and therefore um, the poor just spilled out of certain um, institutions such as the workhouses. So it's very interesting to look at the character of Edmund Scrooge from the point of view of uh, industrialization and understand the gothic nature which suffuses characters such as Scrooge and uh, the businessmen like him. The 1840s were not merely hungry but hard-hearted. It was a philosophy embodied in Edmund Scrooge, not merely a solitary miser like for example George Eliot Silas Marner, but the spirit of the age in human and arguably in human form. Hard heads, hard hearts, good business. Soft heads and soft hearts led to the bankruptcy court, Scrooge would have said. Dickens agreed. As I've just pointed out, the hard-hearted nature of uh, industrialization is represented in Edmund Scrooge. He's not just an individual, lonely, um, miserly character, but he represents the spirit of the age, um, the nature of the age um, in all its humanity. Scrooge would have believed that what is uh, the need of the hour is hard-heartedness, um, hearts that doesn't uh, soften towards the needy because he believed that the hard heart would lead to good business and that is what is represented in the character of Scrooge. However, Dickens disagreed with that philosophy and he does um, something which is in his power to uh, transform the hard-hearted nature of Scrooge. Children worked like slaves in Manchester factories. As Michael Slater points out, the chimneys in the background of John Leach's illustration of the destitute children, ignorance and want, are more reminiscent of Manchester's industrial landscape than of London streets. 
Six months after A Christmas Carol was published, the 1844 Factories Act decreed, however, that 9 to 13 year olds could only work 9 hours a day, 6 days a week. This was regarded as humane reform. One thing that uh, has to be uh, acknowledged is that there was a massive prevalence of uh, child labor during the Industrial Revolution in Great uh, Britain. And uh, the critic Michael Slater points out that uh, the illustration um, in A Christmas Carol, uh, in especially one, um, there's one where you can see the uh, chimneys of factories in the background uh, uh, and that illustration puts, uh, pertains to the representation of two destitute children, ignorance and want. They are embodiments of those two qualities. The children represent ignorance and want. And in that illustration, there are um, uh, images of chimneys. And uh, Slater argues that this image is representative of Manchester factories rather than London streets. And Six months after the publication of A Christmas uh, Carol, there is a very, very uh, influential uh, reform. There is a change uh, in the Factories Act, and that states that 9 to 30 year olds cannot work uh, more than nine hours a day um, and six days a week. So one can connect Dickens's writing to this kind of uh, social reform. Why did the industries employ children? Why were they wanted for this work? Children were cheap labor, but more importantly, their fingers were small and dexterous. But the machines were dangerous. They were crippled. There were crippled tiny Thames by the hundred in Manchester. You can see the connections uh, making sense uh, when you read all these uh, social contexts to A Christmas Carol. Children were employed by um, the masters of factories because children were firstly cheap labor. They had very dexterous fingers which were helpful in the process of, of uh, producing um, stuff, things, materials, despite their uh, you know, uh, ideal characteristics, children were also uh, negatively affected uh, by the uh, dangerous machines. They got crippled and that statement that there were plenty of tiny Tims uh, in Manchester is uh, really uh, disturbing. Children are crippled, turned into inhuman, subhuman beings by these dangerous machines. Children are gothicized in some sense by these um, changes, industrial uh, changes in society. The modern reader of whatever age is less sensitive to sentimentality than our Victorian forebears. At Dickens's reading from uh, his novels, audiences would regularly be moved to open tears, for example, uh, to open tears by, for example, The Death of Little Nell in The Old Curiosity Shop or The Murder of Nancy in Oliver Twist. One suspects that many Victorian tears were shed over the foreseen but happily forestalled death of Tiny Tim. Victorians were very sentimental, unlike the modern uh, readers. Um, they easily cried. Um, they, they were moved by the death of uh, uh, little Nell, the child who was struggling uh, very hard to take care of her old grandfather, and uh, likewise Nancy, who looks after Oliver Twist, uh, um, is, is somebody who also moves the audience to tears when she dies uh, in a gruesome manner. In the case of Tiny Tim in A Christmas Carol, that death is expected, but happily it doesn't happen because there is radical transformation in Agnes Scrooge. The child characters, as I've been discussing uh, over uh, the lectures, are important uh, figures. It is easy to bring them forward and make the reader see the impact that um, the industrial transformation is having on these uh, tiny bodies and spirits, how their innocence uh, is uh, negatively affected by the rapid change of uh, the change in industrial uh, revolution and progress. And uh, Dickens is very, very uh, 
uh, shrewd in the way he uh, utilizes these um, child characters in his uh, novella, especially the representation of ignorance and want uh, in terms of um, representations in the form of children does work um, really powerfully in, in the mind of the readers when they uh, read their destitute nature. The ghosts in A Christmas Carol are by turns comic, grotesque, and allegorical. Professor John Mullen uh, reflects on the essential role in developing the novel's meaning and structure. The ghosts, the spirits, the supernatural beings in A Christmas Carol are not one-dimensional. You can argue that they are very funny, they are grotesque, bizarre, and they also symbolize um, other values. They are allegorical, they represent certain qualities. Um, there had been ghosts in literature before the Victorians, but the ghost story as a distinct and popular genre was the invention of the Victorians. Charles Dickens was hugely influential in establishing the genre's popularity, not only as a writer, but also an, as an editor. His journals, Household Words, and All the Year Round, specialized in ghost stories, and other contemporary journals followed. John Mullen, the critic, argues that the ghost story is an invention of the Victorians, and in fact, Dickens had played a massive role in establishing the generic uh, quality of this uh, ghost uh, narrative. Um, both as a writer as a, uh, and as an editor, he not only wrote ghost stories, but he also encouraged the publication of ghost stories in his journals, um, such as uh, Household World, uh, Words and All the Year Round. Dickens's close friend and biographer, John Foster, said that the novelist had a hankering after ghosts. Not that Dickens exactly believed in ghosts, but he was intrigued by our belief in them. In A Christmas Carol, the first of his ghost stories, he harnesses that belief by making the supernatural a natural extension of the real world of Scrooge and his victims. This is a long way from the specters of earlier Gothic fiction. Dickens loved tales with ghosts in them. In fact, he had a, a, a proclivity towards ghosts. That's what is uh, mentioned by John Foster, his friend and biographer. And in fact, uh, A Christmas Carol is the first of his ghost stories. And in that story, what he does is the, the world of the ghost becomes an extension of the real world. There's no um, massive uh, division between the real world and the Gothic world, the, the world of the supernatural. When that woman is sitting outside, when that destitute woman is sitting outside uh, Scrooge's counting house uh, with all these ghosts of businessmen dancing around her, you cannot um, differentiate reality and uh, the spiritual world, that there is a natural blend of the two. And this has a very, very powerful impact on the readers. Dickens will go on to make uh, um, further um, explorations in the world of uh, ghost stories, but this very first uh, uh, experiment of Dickens in um, ghost story is, is uh, fantastic and very powerful. The first strictly supernatural sight in the story is the door knocker on the outside door of Scrooge's chambers that metamorphoses as the miser looks at it into the face of his former partner, Jacob Marley, uh, dead for seven years. The hair curiously stirred as if by breath or hot air, and, the though, and though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. You can see how gradually Dickens builds up the Gothic characteristics of the setting. In fact, um, the knocker on the door of Scrooge's chamber changes um, into the face of his former uh, partner, Jacob Marley, who is now dead. Um, he has been dead for seven years. And look at the way um, Dickens describes uh, the door knocker, which looks like the face of Marley. Uh, the hair seems to stir uh, as if somebody is breathing. Um, and uh, or it could be because of hot air and the eyes, even though they are wide open, 
uh, they are perfectly motionless, they, they have frozen. So there is an eagerness to this kind of description. Um, on the one hand, they could be very comic as well, if you uh, um, think about it in a lighthearted way, but at the same time, they are grotesque. So this is the nature of uh, the terrible um, in the hands of uh, Charles Dickens. The terrible can at any moment become comic and grotesque. Yet Dickens' sense of fantasy brings the horrible and comic together. In the surrounding gloom, the face has a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. The weird mix of the terrible and the comic is kept up when Marley's ghost finally appears carrying its chain of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, and the like. Like a parody ghost, its body is transparent, as Scrooge observes. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bubbles, but he had never believed it until now. Once again, there is a nice blend, uh, a, a comic blend of the horrible and the funny. Um, there is dismal light in that uh, room. It's gloomy, um, it's, it's bleak, but um, yet it, it looks... Uh, the face looks like a bad lobster that immediately brings a uh, laugh um, to the person uh, looking at that image, yet it is a dark cellar-like setting. So you can see that a strange combination of the terrible and the comic um, is um, kind of kept up by uh, Dickens's narrative until the appearance of Marley's ghost. And even that ghost is like a parody ghost. It, it's as if it's a satiric representation of um, the ghost uh, character because the body is uh, transparent and uh, Scrooge immediately remembers that people said that Marley had no bowels um, and, and he can't believe it until this particular moment because he can just see through and, and there's nothing inside. So uh, the ghost is terrible in, in, in its visitation, yet the representation of the ghost can also be comic. So this is the nature of the gothic that one can see in uh, A Christmas Carol. Um, the thematic significance could be that if the ghost is too terrible, too horrible, then um, Edmunds or Scrooge would just flee in panic and, and there would be no transformatory work um, being done on his psyche by these um, spiritual presences in this uh, novella. On Christmas Eve, the city is itself a place of spectres where it had not been light all day. Outside Scrooge's counting house, the fog is so dense that although the court was of the narrowest, the houses opposite were mere phantoms. The bell in a nearby church tower strikes the hours and quarters as if its teeth were chattering and it's frozen up ahead up there. The city itself, London in itself, becomes a place of spectres, ghosts, and uh, there had been no light the entire day. And outside of um, Scrooge's house, uh, counting house, the fog is so dense that one cannot see uh, anything outside very distinctly. Uh, in fact, everything looked like a spirit. The houses looked like spirits um, hanging uh, about. And uh, the church tower nearby, when it uh, strikes um, the hour, uh, it looked as if, it felt as if um, its teeth were chattering in, in, in its head. So uh, you can see how uh, there is a very powerful representation of um, the city as ghosts and the people as spirits. So that makes this uh, novel, uh, novella, a, a very, very uh, powerful uh, representation of a particular idea that is uh, very thoroughly uh, and grotesquely gothicized. After Marley's ghost had left him, Scrooge looks out of his window and sees the air filled with phantoms, many of them chained souls who had once been known to Scrooge. It is like a fantastic vision of the city that Scrooge already knows well. Like Macbeth, Scrooge because of his sins, sees visions that are for him alone. Once Marley's ghost has gone, uh, he just looks at the air around him and it seems to be full of ghosts, full of spirits, supernatural presences, and many of them were, uh, you know, bound up souls, chained souls, um, that cannot uh, freely uh, 
uh, move about uh, or, or, or speak their hearts and and what is pointed out uh, to the readers by Dickens is that these souls have been known to Scrooge. He were uh, familiar with that with them once upon a time. So this is a fantastic, really bizarre, surreal vision um, of the city that Scrooge knows by heart. And like Macbeth, who can um, see uh, visions that are meant for him alone, and nobody else around Macbeth could see those uh, ghostly visitations. Just like Macbeth, uh, Scrooge could um, see these visions that are meant for his eyes alone. Thank you for watching. I'll continue in the next session.